thank you. Uh, thank you all for, for being here. And um, the report brings to a close uh, two years of very intense work for us. Uh, the report, as some of you may have seen, is quite wide-ranging, um, touching on different aspects of the women workers' lives. So I, what we will do is to, uh, you know, <coughs> briefly highlight uh, um, main findings of the report, and if there are any questions at the end, we are happy to. Uh... So, um, Deepika has already talked about the background, which is economic liberalization, but what I would do uh, is to highlight two particular uh, themes. One is the policy context, and the other is the economic structure. The policy context broadly, of course, as she has already said, is economic liberalization. In the coming of global supply chains came with uh, economic liberalization. And we're all familiar with global supply chains, so I will not uh, elaborate on that. But basically, manufacturing and delivering a product or even a service, when those st steps take place in more than one country, and for example, if a company sources raw materials in China, manufactures the product in India, and sells it to customers in North America, the supply chain is global. And of course, the ultimate uh, purpose of, of constructing these chains is accumulation of profit for multinational capital. Um, in India, the economy opened up to FDI, which was earlier hugely restricted, bringing a large number of global players into, the, into manu Indian manufacturing and services. So the present government's policy, uh, but I should also highlight that the present government's policy comes as a continuation of uh, the previous government's policy in opening up the, uh, the economy. The present government's policy emphasis particularly on making in India provided a further push to the global supply chain paradigm and India's role therein. So there have been a set of policies here, the production-linked incentive scheme, the national logistics policy, resilient supply chain initiative in India, Australia, and Japan, designed to promote global collaborations, create economies of scale, enhance exports, and so on. Now, the relationship between global supply chains and employment is problematic, but um, mm, in general, trade is seen to be profitable for all economies. Export and global supply chains in terms of how much employment they generate is a, a contentious issue. I will not go into that. But in general, it could be said that the, in, the emergence of global supply chains in India has not been particularly employment friendly. Um, these have been both capital and technology in, in, intensive, particularly in sectors like automobiles, pharmaceuticals, elect electronics, steel, and so on. Um, so the place of unskilled and semi-skilled labor within this paradigm of global supply chains is quite, uh, mm, mm, is, is something to be, to, be, to be questioned. Now, as far as the employment structure is concerned, very briefly. Why is this important? It's important to show that manufacturing sector employment, and particularly industry, more broadly industry, employment in industry has gone down. And this shows you that the sectoral share of agriculture has continuously gone down. It's 14%, 14 to 15% in 23, industry is 28%, services is 55%. However, agriculture continues to employ the largest number of persons. Services which leads economic growth in India, the percentage of employment is quite low in comparison. It is only 30%. Coming to Karnataka, <coughs> this pattern is repeated, actually. Agriculture share in GDP is 15%, whereas share in employment is 46%. This is quite a dramatic finding, uh, is uh, something to, to underline, because one thinks of Karnataka as one of the most industrially developed states, high rate of growth. The growth rate has been uh, sustained at 8.5% for the last 25 years almost. 
And this growth is led by the services sector, which is 66%. However, the employment generated is only 34%. And as we all know, uh, <coughs> services sector employment is narrowly focused on technology uh, and you know, technology-informed persons at the top, and there is a large bulk of uh, semi-skilled and unskilled service providers at the, at the bottom. <clears throat> so this has been a source of continuous debate that the manufacturing sector employment has come down, and in fact, this indicates the severity of the employment crisis in India predating the pandemic. Um, the call for return to labor-intensive manufacturing has been given by a large number of economists. The late Ajit Ghosh, who wrote the India Employment Report in 2018, more recently Radhika Kapoor's work, and multiple others. Um, yeah. So it, it's in this scenario that the global supply chain in garment exports stands out as <coughs> Labor intensive, particularly stands out as labor intensive. In India, textiles contribute 15% of exports. The RMG sector, 40% 40, 40 of textile exports. So you can see that it, the, the sector as a whole occupies a very central role in the economy. The employment is 12 million, and Karnataka, we have about 1,500 units spread over, particularly over Bangalore and Mysore, but in increasingly other places also, and 85% of these are women. <clears throat> the survey <coughs> was of 184 women, and this also Deepika has touched on. We followed the usual methods of a questionnaire-based survey, but uh, we also were fortunate enough to be able to do very in-depth and repeated interviews with women workers in their households in order to capture the, you know, some of the essential features of their lives, and also with CSOs, NGOs, <coughs> trade unions. I want to say that the uh, garment sector is very widely studied, not just in Karnataka, but in other parts of the country as well. However, the point of departure of, of, of this study really was, as I have said, in-depth individual meetings in worker homes, focusing on the impact of the industry, not only on women's work, but on their lives and <coughs> on the lives of their households, their children, in general, broadly. So, therefore, the central questions that we asked are uh, kind of interesting for us. What is, given the decline of the manufacturing sector and that RMG is, uh, is part of the manufacturing sector, a new part, one important question that we asked was, what is the nature of the workforce which is being created through the expansion of global supply chain in apparels? The singularity of the sector, of course, is the large number of women coming in from rural and semi-rural areas. And is this a transformation of a rural workforce into an urban working class? What is the relationship between workplace and livelihood and home? In what ways does garment work facilitate the process of urbanization? This also was a key question for us because urbanization is seen as one of the most important hallmarks of economic development. And here we are seeing a regular pattern of migration of these women from rural, semi-rural areas of Karnataka as well as interstate migrants. So what is the, ca the character and nature and the process of urbanization that is happening here? And then what is the impact of garments work on socio-economic mobility of the worker and of the household intergenerationally? Does the expanding presence of this sector enable first-generation migrants to create a better life for themselves and their children? This, the last question comes directly out of the history of economic development, particularly in advanced industrialized countries, where migrants, 
movement from rural areas into urban industrial areas is followed perhaps by a period of hardship, of economic hardship, but in, invariably had led to a, a great deal of social and economic mobility for these migrant households via the process of their incorporation into industrial labor. So part of the question came from our study of this experience to ask whether this had been replicated in, in this situation to some extent. Um, who is the garment worker? Um, local migrants from Tumkur, Mysore, Mandya, and Hassan districts. The age uh, group was, um, I think there is a mistake here, the age group is 18 to 50 years. Um, typically we found them to be educated up to class 8 or up to, in rare cases, up to class 12. And in most cases, education had been discontinued because the family could not or would not afford to educate uh, girl children. There was a preference for investing in the education of sons. So discrimination in the natal home was something which was reported by almost every worker that we interviewed. Caste was predominantly OBC. Natal and marit marital households were invariably landless agricultural families. That is, those who may have very little land on which their houses were, were located, but who had very little productive land for commercial agriculture. And they were therefore uh, you know, employed in the unorganized sector in rural areas. Early marriage, of course, because there, was, you know, there would be one less mouth to feed within the household. This led uh, them to another indigent family, that is the family of the husband, and finally both husband and wife moved to the city to find work. The woman finds work in the garment sector. Now, the <clears throat> other trajectory through which migrant women are coming in are very young workers from, uh, from the states of Orissa and Jharkhand, some from Bihar, Madhya Pradesh, and Chhattisgarh. A percentage of respondents who were interstate migrants were 33%, and the age distribution is as, as given. We found higher levels of education because this is a, a younger uh, workforce, so many had actually completed uh, high school, some class 10, some class 12. Most were unmarried, um, and the recruitment was through skill centers and contractors in home states. I don't have a great deal of time to talk about the, the recruitment process, but we can come back to it at, if there is time for question and answer. Now, the minimum wage in the garment sector, basic plus DA, is only 10,330, which is, as you can see, lower than what unskilled workers, this should be unskilled, sorry, this should be unskilled, for unskilled workers in, in other zones, which is 14,106. Oh, okay, sorry, so skilled and unskilled. Now, the wage being so low, a very high percentage of the workers we interviewed said that they did overtime work. 16% said that they did other paid work, domestic, piece rate, tailoring, selling flowers. So there were some who did overtime work within the factory, others who did paid work outside the factory hours. So the median hours of work in a day for non-factory paid work was two hours. So typically these women, they come back home after factory hours and then they go out to work again or they take in work at home, which could be tailoring. Um, so what the desired work, work, work change obviously would be a higher salary. And we should note that 93% did not have an employment contract. Now, we uh, you know, divided the workers into three categories. One is the sole earner, that is the worker was the only earner of the household, a single earner. Or the worker was a main earner, 21%, which is the worker earned along with another person in the household or another other persons in the household. 
Supplementary earners were those whose income was less than other earners within the household, and this, this was 50%. So the total household income, as you can see, was quite low. For 54% of the workers, the household income was between 10,000 to 25,000. And above 30,000, we have only about 7% of the workers. So in a high cost, high uh, cost of living city like Bangalore, this uh, speaks a lot about the economic level at which the garment uh, worker households were. Now, <coughs> a very important uh, aspect of garment work, which is uh, fairly well known in, 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 in the city amongst academics, policymakers, activists, is uh, abusive behavior of managers within the shop floor. And 100% had reported verbal abuse. Restrictions on toilet time, which sounds like an impossibility in the 21st century, however, was reported by 68%. They are not allowed to use the toilet as many times as they would like to or to spend more than a stipulated time in the toilet. This time is monitored by the shop floor uh, manager in order to put limits on how much time they can spend away from their productive activities. Isolation of the worker, individual isolation, is a frequently used form of punishment Physical abuse, 61%. Sexual abuse, 39%. So coercion in one form or the other is really used as a mechanism of production. And this has been internalized by shop floor managers, HR managers, across the hierarchy of management in uh, garment factories. It is not really questioned. Mm. Obviously, therefore, there is a very strong tendency for, for the women to leave the sector or to leave the particular factory, to leave the particular factory and go in search of the elusive better employment conditions is very common. But <coughs> more or less, we have seen that where factory employment is concerned, it's a long tenure, typically from the age of, say, 2021 20, to the age of, say, 60. The garment sector is a critical exception to, to this rule because we find that years of experience in the sector as also years of experience in the same factory are very notably limited. So if you look at 11 to 15 years, which could be a, you know, a, a, a good example to take, within the sector, it's only 30%. 21 to 25 years, which we would see typically in other sectors, is only 2%. Similarly, years of experience in the same factory, 16 to 20 years is only 2%, which reflects very poorly, really, on the uh, conditions of employment within uh, within the sector. Now, as far as the reasons for, uh, for, uh, for keeping the job or not keeping the job are concerned, I don't want to go into to, to the details of these slides, but in general, the reasons for keeping the job or trying to keep the job were mostly negative, that they would not be able to find a similar job elsewhere. This is a job which brings a, a stable salary at the end of the month, and that is not replicable in other sectors, uh, in other un unorganized sectors, so that was one reason. And the reasons for to not keep the job were obviously low wages, supervisors' behavior, or it could be work is too hard and working conditions are too hard. <clears throat> now, as far as overtime wages are concerned, again, uh, you know, the stipulated payment for overtime wages is double that day's salary. So only 61% said they got that. Single wages, 32% got it. But I would ask you to look at the last three columns where if we add it up, 20%. yeah, 20% are not even paid for overtime work. They're either given what is known as a comp off, that is they can take a day off, or they are not even paid, 
or they don't even know whether they, they are paid or not. In other words, they are not paid. So that is a significant finding, we thought. Mm. These are the types of work that they do in non-factory uh, spaces, domestic work, piece rate work, tailoring, or selling flowers. What is the physical and psychological impact of a 12-hour workday? So we can assume that they work about eight to nine hours in the factory, and you combine this with work uh, done in the household and for payment outside the household. And some of the women told us, some of, some of it is given here. Um, these were narratives of great pain, great anguish, great hardship. And we actually, when translated, first of all, into English and translated in, into you know, a formal uh, space like this, where, present, where we are presenting it in very uh, sanitized and sanctified uh, context, much of this, that is lost, but still uh, we, have, we thought we should highlight uh, some of the things that they have told us. Um, can we go back to that slide? So the impact really is seen in terms of uh, what's known as time poverty, that there is no time for them to do anything except work, whether at the factory, in the house, or outside to make some extra income. So time is really hugely, hugely overstretched, I think beyond the imagination of, of middle-class uh, scholars like us. Lack of attention to children was something that was very widely reported, and again, a point of anguish and physical exhaustion. Now, I just want to say that time poverty um, extracted from its context of poor women, poor working class women, Time poverty is perhaps something every working woman experiences at some point or other of their lives. I mean, we all have uh, careers, homes, children, et cetera, et cetera, and very few of us would have not experienced that extreme dilemma and the emotional cost of trying to balance multiple demands of, on our time, and of course this has some impact on, on our physical and emotional states. What makes the lives of these women distinctive, even in the context of this generalized female experience, is, the next slide, is the kind of violence, physical violence, that they face at home. And uh, you'll see that about 57% said that violence is a regular um, experience in their homes. It can be verbal, it can be emotional, psychological. 61% said they face physical violence. Financial is the extraction from them of their earnings by an abusive husband as if it is his right, sexual, and other kinds. So to us, it seemed that this really was the edge of, of the extreme coercion that they suffered, both in the factory and at home, in, uh, you know, in the context of the violence that they undergo as a daily, everyday experience in both spaces. And I will come back to that later. Um, again, much of the hardship that they are undergoing as workers and within their households is really because they want to invest in their children's education so that the children lead a better life than they have been able to do. This was repeated again and again. The children, my, my daughter should not join the garment sector. My, my children should be educated. The aspiration is for the children to join the IT sector. That was like a really widely shared uh, um, uh, dream that these women had. Unfortunately, most of the women could not afford 
anything but, uh, you know, the local government school or the local corporation school for their children, which are Kannada medium, and nothing wrong with that, but they do not provide the, the resource of, of facility with the English language, which gets you a good job. Um, many of the children dropped out from their studies at a fairly early age, class eight, class 10, Rarely had they reached the class 12 stage, and most of the adult children were employed in the unorganized sector again, like their mothers and fathers. Dysfunctional families was one of the main reasons which we saw was the as, as a reason for children to drop out, because there was no motivation, no assistance, no cooperation within the family to push them towards visualizing a better life for themselves. So most had joined, again, the unorganized sector. Their salaries, again, were very low. Some of the mothers did not even know how much their uh, sons uh, earned. Many of the, the girls had, again, you know, been married at a very early age and gone into more, more or less the same economic status and the same life patterns as their mothers, experiencing physical violence from their husbands, so on and so forth. This is something that needs to be researched. What, is, what are the connections between the urban unorganized sector and male uh, intimate partner violence? in working class households. We, of course, have not been able to do that because it was not our mandate, but everything pointed to much more in-depth research in, in, into this part of the women's lives. Now, <coughs> when a person migrates from a rural area to an urban area, finds a regular job, regular in the sense there is salaried wage, one expects this to be an <clears throat> indication that urbanization is happening, not only of the individual, but of the household. However, in most cases, we found that the women were, were not really planning to stay on in Bangalore because, because of the low income, low savings, high debts, they had not been able to save anything which would enable them to stay on in the city after they retire. This was one aspect of it. The other aspect of it was that we found at least 10 women who were uh, past the age of working in really pathetic situations of old age, ill health, no family support, no savings, and their vulnerability was of a kind which was, you know, it, it, it didn't give the impression that this woman had spent a lifetime working because they were close to to the point of depending entirely on charity. So this really was a situation where we were looking at women's labor, which had been expended for 20 to 30 years in the city, but they had nothing really to, to, to sustain them in the old age. And many were, in a sense, sent back to the village. The village acted as a space of retreat, or at least as, as a space of minimum sustenance in a context where the city would not be able to provide them even with that sustenance. <clears throat> with regard to the interstate migrant workers, as I told you, we found a much younger group of workers who were coming into the city we are state or state-supported private skill training agencies. These skill training agencies have been set up in the capital cities of so-called backward states. So very poor households in villages in these states were approached by contractors through the local panchayats, and the families were convinced that their daughters would get good jobs. These families are often at the edge of some kind of crisis or vulnerability. They send their daughters to the state capitals for training, and <clears throat> from there to Bangalore, uh, they're given a train ticket and put up in hostels here. Once here, they face isolation and alienation in the workplace, largely due to you know, distance from local workers because of language, social customs, they are a younger group, so on and so forth. 
They are housed in overcrowded hostels or low-end rental flats. The widely shared aspiration is really to return to the native village or home state after a few years of work. And here again, we can see that labor is being brought into the city for the purposes of capital, for, you know, for capital to extract value at low wages. But this is not a model of urbanization that is being talked about or that is being put forward as the paradigm of urbanization because there is a, almost a universally shared tendency to go back to the village. So this is, in some sense, this is industrialization or the uh, encroachment of global capital into the local economy without having the desired effects of urbanization. Um, I just want to say briefly that we are looking here at a workforce which is first generation, semi-rural or rural. More importantly, this is a workforce which can be described as footloose, just because they change employment so many times during their lifetime, and therefore have very little ownership in terms of the industry in which they are working. So as a constituency, they are obviously very, very difficult to organize. Only five to eight percent of the workforce is organized into unions. There are unfortunately five unions uh, in, in, uh, in a context where uh, the percentage of unionized workers is very low and there are deep divisions and multiple fragmentations within the unions themselves. We have publications on, on these uh, themes if anyone is interested. Um, what is important to understand in this whole uh, scheme of things is the role of the state as it is complicit in the production of a disempowered female workforce. In the first instance, the state fails to provide a robust public education system which girl children of indigent families, of poor families, can access without being displaced from the education system just because their parents are not in a position to or are not willing to support their education. So that is perhaps the first failure of, of the state and this we are seeing you know, in very, very recent times. The state has also designed and supported skill centers which produce a semi-skilled workforce which garment manufacturers use for surplus value extraction. So in a sense, the state is actually standing between capital and, and the worker, and while providing work to the workforce, the kind of work that is being, pro being provided actually is hugely disadvantageous to the workers. The failure to regulate global supply chains in garment production ex and exports, this has been written about very widely, that the state's regulatory system, inspection of factories, etc., hardly is functional in the garment sector. Inspectors do occasionally come, but uh, there is a understanding between factory owners and the inspectors, so nothing is really reported. So the in the final analysis, this is the creation of a low-wage, low-skilled migrant workforce from historically migrant, marginalized tribes and communities. And we have seen that, you know, when a workforce is needed for capital, it is produced somehow or it is created somehow. And more or less the same process is going on here. So, <laughs> we would also like to highlight uh, what is happening in the garment sector in the context of you know, larger theories of social reproduction and the crisis of social reproduction within capitalism. What we find here is working class households continuously strive for survival and well-being and the place of women workers is key to this struggle because it is really they who are not only physically struggling to keep the households together, but 
It is they who have the imagination of somehow keeping the household together, educating the children, nourishing everyone, and creating a social infrastructure with their very, very low means. In this struggle, they are not supported, actually, either by capital or by the state. It is, uh, in, in a sense, it is a solo struggle. So you can see clearly the interconnected nature of women's labor, both from within their households and factories. It is unpaid care at care work at home, which we are all familiar with the concept of unpaid care, and low wage garment work in the factory. What actually connects these two spaces is the normalization of violence at home and in the factory. So I think it's important to understand that we are not really looking at women workers who are low waged and who are facing coercion on the shop floor. We are looking at very real historical subjects who are necessarily the objects of violence, physical violence, both in the home and in the factory, and this has been normalized for them. So this is the creation of a workforce which is overspent, exhausted, and largely uncared for, and unfortunately leading to the reproduction of a future generation of marginalized workers which I have uh, you know, tried to explain uh, through what is happening to the next generation. Thank you very much, and I, I, I will end here. But before doing that, let me just say that uh, I don't belong to CVDEP, but I was made to feel almost a part, part of it. We were a great group, we were a great team. Like particularly to thank uh, Rekha, who conceptualized the research, designed it in many ways, and of course, as Deepika said, without her, this would not have been possible. We'd also like to thank Kaveri, who again decide, uh, you know, designed the research and did a lot of things. Uh, she was quite indispensable. And I'd like to particularly thank them because they put up with me. <laughs> they didn't know there could be someone who doesn't know how to do Google Docs <laughs> or spreadsheets, so on and so forth. So great thanks, Deepika, for her overall guidance, and Sandhya, of course, for keeping our feet on the ground. Before I end, would really like to express my gratitude to Mr. Gopinath, founder and former director of CVDEP, who's unfortunately not here today. Mr. Gopinath, uh, when I started my journey as a researcher in labor and particularly on the garment sector, Mr. Gopinath uh, was my mentor to some extent and uh, we became fellow travelers on, on, on this journey and I have learned more from him really than from anyone else uh, in, in the sector. And so with this, I'd like to end. Thank you.